next on Unsolved Mysteries. Late one night, an argument turns into a deadly high-speed chase for a popular Los Angeles DJ. When a college freshman is brutally murdered, her mother takes on the case to find her daughter's killer. A dedicated father, loving husband, and aspiring engineer is gunned down by an unknown assailant. Oh, oh my God. And meet the sweetheart swindler, a charming but ruthless con man who steals his victims' hearts and then their cash. Cunning, deceit, and lies. Maybe you can figure out who's telling the truth. I'm Dennis Farina, and this is Unsolved Mysteries. Los Angeles, California. Twenty-six-year-old DJ Lee Selwyn was a familiar face at trendy rock and roll nightclubs in Los Angeles. Lee was close friends with many rock stars. He also hung out with motorcycle riders who cruised the LA streets after hours. Late one night, Lee would fight for his life, the victim of a bizarre encounter with a crazed killer. Lee Selwyn was a man who just loved the nightlife of Los Angeles. However, simply because he looked different, Lee and his friends were targeted for murder. The sad irony of Lee's death is that he was only an innocent bystander. When he first got his motorcycle, I guess I was probably a little bit nervous about it, but I knew that he was careful, and I knew that he wouldn't take unnecessary chances. He wasn't a crazy kind of person, and so I really didn't worry about him. Early one morning, Lee and three friends left the Hollywood nightclub, unaware of the danger that waited for them on the street. They rode two by two, Lee and a friend trailing Bob Califoot and another friend who rode in front. Driving along, and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, this truck comes flying by me. As he comes by, he dives in on me laughing, dives it on me. I look over at Mike, and in L.A., this happens every day. Every day, but not so blatant. What are you doing? What are you trying to do? I got infuriated because he was trying to kill me. And I'm really close to the guy, and he starts screaming at me and looking like a nut. Drugs, beer, whatever, psycho. Then he rolls his window down and spits in my face. Anybody that's spit in their face gets irate. So I punched out his mirror, and he's still spitting at me, growling, screaming. And then he starts reaching down like he's got a gun. I put my fist through his uh, driver's window. As soon as I broke his window, he shot out of the intersection, and he's doing a U-turn, and Mike and I look at each other, this guy's gonna kill us. He's coming after us. He just wanted to kill me. We're flying down the street, and I see his headlights bearing down on us. So we choose to go right, and as I look back, he comes flying through the intersection, screeching, bouncing, and comes to a slight stop. When Lee got to the intersection, he turned left. The truck followed him. Now, Lee was the target of the driver's rage. According to the witnesses, they were both going anywhere from 60 to 90 miles an hour. Here you have a young man who is known by his friends, known by his family as a very peaceable man who purposely avoids fights. And all of a sudden, he's in a situation where he's terrorized by someone in a car. And this terror lasted approximately about a five-mile chase with this man right on his rear end. And 
he chased him until the time he actually hit him and drove him into a telephone pole. Lee, when he flew through the air, he flew close to 180 feet before he came to a rest. This is a murder. It's a homicide. Someone intentionally took the life of another person. It's a homicide. Lee received a massive skull fracture in the collision, which led to his death. I received a call from Cedars. They said that he was in the intensive care. And I knew, I just knew. But I don't believe it yet. It's real, but it isn't real. He was such a big part of my life. He was my buddy. He wasn't just my son, he was my buddy. At Lee's funeral, Hundreds of his friends came to say goodbye. This music video was set to an original song dedicated to Lee's memory by the rock group Little Caesar. It was amazing to see all these people who really cared. There's no way that that, that can be consolation enough. It was a real tribute to who Lee was by how many people were there and how many people really have, have shown how much they care. Lee's friends organized a rock concert in his honor with special guest performances by Billy Idol and Julian Lennon. The proceeds from the concert went to a fund offering a reward to anyone who can bring Lee's murderer to justice. A lot of people take the opinion that these guys are motorcycle gang members, when in fact there was four guys out having a good time. They happened to like to ride motorcycles. These people weren't doing anything wrong that night. And they had a right to be out there riding their motorcycles and dressed the way they were. Lee Selwyn wasn't even the man who gave him the problem. But it didn't matter to him who was on the motorcycle. He had to catch that motorcycle, and he had to run him over. It's incomprehensible to me to think that we could never find this man. I can't even imagine that I could live the rest of my life not knowing who did this. Update. Nearly five years after Lee Selwyn was murdered, authorities were finally able to file charges in the case. One of our viewers provided the information that led to the indictment of Franklin Legrand Perkins. Already serving time for violating his probation, Perkins was convicted of first-degree murder and was sentenced to life in prison. Next, when the daughter of an undercover officer is found dead, it looks like a tragic accident, but it's not. Anchorage, Alaska, just before dawn. 18-year-old Bonnie Craig is on her way to school. Two days a week, she walks 45 minutes through the early morning darkness to catch a bus to the University of Alaska. Bonnie prides herself on always arriving early for her 7 a.m. class. But today, she won't make it to school. Later in the afternoon, another college student is out shooting photographs on a hiking trail when she makes a sickening discovery. The lifeless body of a young woman is floating in a creek. Her remains were located at the bottom of a 33-foot cliff in fairly shallow water. It wasn't a place that you would normally uh, hike along the, the stream to get to where she was. So she could have been hiking and taken a misstep somewhere 
and slipped and fallen off of the cliff. The following day, the victim was identified as Bonnie Craig. The medical examiner said she had drowned, but Bonnie had also suffered severe head injuries, probably from falling off a cliff. They told me Bonnie had died in a hiking accident, and I wouldn't believe it. I still expected Bonnie to be coming up to me and apologizing and saying, I'm sorry, Mom, it wasn't me. Viewing her daughter's body was devastating. However, when Karen took a closer look, she was alarmed by what she saw. Her knuckles were bruised and broken. This is no hiking accident. There was defensive wounds on her body, and I knew that she had been attacked. It was murder. Authorities, however, were slow to conclude that Bonnie had been murdered. What few leads they had, they kept to themselves. But Bonnie's mother, Karen, would finally get some help from a local television reporter. So, can you tell me anything about cause of death, anything like that? Not at this time. You're it was really to tough for the community to take because Bonnie was a well-liked, well-known young lady. Did get an official statement? We talked with Karen several days after Bonnie's body was found, and at that time, troopers still were not releasing much information. In fact, it wasn't until six months later that Karen finally got the results of the sexual assault exam. I had originally asked if she had been raped, and they told me no. After fighting to get information from them, they revealed to me that, yes, Bonnie was brutally raped and murdered. The results of the autopsy showed that there was evidence of sexual activity. We can't confirm whether it was a sexual assault or whether it was consensual sex. My daughter was recently killed over here at McHugh Creek. Karen soon began her own search for information about Bonnie's death. Everybody here in town put up signs, flyers, bumper stickers. We wanted to make sure that until the crime was solved, nobody was going to forget about it. Karen was no stranger to investigations or criminals. She had worked undercover as a reserve officer with the Anchorage police. Wearing a hood and mask to conceal her identity, Karen would nod silently to identify those who had sold her drugs. I was involved in what I thought was minor drug buys. I had gone out five or six times and bought crack for the Anchorage Police Department. Karen, you got a sec? A few months after Bonnie's death, Karen learned that her undercover work may have jeopardized her daughter's life. Karen was approached by an acquaintance who claimed to have information about Bonnie's murder. These guys at the other table. According to Karen, the man said that her family had been targeted on the orders of a local drug lord. He told me that her murder was ordered by this drug lord because it was a message to the Anchorage Police Department to back off. Bonnie was murdered the day after the people that I identified as drug dealers were released from jail. Right. Thanks for seeing me, Detective. Uh, thanks. Have a seat. Karen gave this information to the lead investigator of Bonnie's murder, but she was not satisfied with his response. I'll just say it's a call. He said this was a retribution killing for the undercover work I did with the Anchorage Police Department. Wait, wait, who's his source? When I gave him all the details, he just kept asking me, where are you getting this information? I said it was from somebody who did not want to be identified. Are you going to help me here? Who's your source? I'm not going to reveal my source to you. And I told him I wouldn't reveal my source. He told me, well, then you're hindering your daughter's investigation, and I'm not going to investigate this lead. And to this day, I don't know what they've done, and probably will never know what they've done as far as investigating that lead. The fact that she feels that we may not have uh, investigated uh, thoroughly enough or followed up on her confidential informant's lead, I don't believe to be true. We followed up all the leads, and if she believes that we haven't, it might just be that we haven't filled her in on every single thing that we've done. A full year after Bonnie's murder, the case took an unexpected turn when Karen was contacted by one of Bonnie's teachers. Hello? 
Yes. She really felt that there was this one particular uh -huh. student that may have been involved in the murder. What kid? According to Karen, the teacher became suspicious when she read the student's class journal, which made references to the date of Bonnie's murder, September 28th. His journal was incredibly violent, filled with anger, and he specifically said that September 28th was gonna be a very tough day, that he was gonna be put to a test. The teacher also told Karen that on the morning Bonnie was murdered, the student in question was absent. It was class this morning. I'm sorry, I just overslept. He was wet, like he had just gotten out of a shower, and she said it smelled like he had just poured a whole bottle of cologne on himself. After the murder, his journal became more peaceful. There wasn't the anger, yet he knew that there was a student that had just died, and there was no references to Bonnie's murder. Detectives investigated the student, but quickly ruled him out as a suspect. DNA evidence recovered from uh, Bonnie at the scene did not match uh, DNA evidence collected from the student at the college. I immediately told them that didn't seem right to rule him out because of DNA, because there could have been more than one person. If there was two people, it didn't have to be his DNA. Karen then uncovered more disturbing information. That particular student did have a assault charge against him, and he had been bailed out of jail by a young man who had been involved in another murder. I found it very surprising when I, when I saw the bail slip who bailed um, this student, this potential suspect, out of jail. The student and several other of his friends were involved in a fatal shooting here several years ago. It doesn't sound like the type of group that a student who was up and up would have been involved with. I do believe that he could have been the murderer. Despite their disagreements, both Karen and investigators do agree on one thing. The key to this mystery might rest with Bonnie's morning routine. A young lady who was a neighbor of hers, who was a paper delivery type person, saw her around 520 walking down her street. Another gentleman who had seen Bonnie a couple of days prior in the area of the bus stop saw her again that morning. And that was about the last time that we have a confirmation of anybody uh, definitively uh, seeing Bonnie alive was around 6.20 that morning. One neighbor reported seeing an unknown car in front of Bonnie's house early that morning. And someone called the police tip line, claiming to have seen Bonnie that same morning talking to two men in a vehicle. Could someone have been lying in wait for Bonnie Craig? Karen intends to do everything that she can to keep the investigation alive. Until the crime is solved, it just keeps going through your head that somebody else's child will end up murdered and raped also. So until this crime is solved, you can't give up. Update. Nearly 13 years after Bonnie Craig's death, police finally made an arrest. A DNA match led them to Kenneth Dion, who was on probation for robbery at the time of the murder. He was later convicted and sentenced to life in prison. No one knows exactly what happened to Bonnie between the time she left home and the time that her body was found later that day. But. As a result of Bonnie's case, Alaska lawmakers have passed a bill making DNA samples mandatory for all felons in custody. Coming up, your tips help put a serial rapist behind bars. New York City. We recently profiled the story of a single woman who was attacked in her apartment. David Gauz, the resident handyman, forced his way into her apartment, raped her, and then threatened her with an ice pick. 
The woman called 911 as soon as her attacker left, but Gauze disappeared before police arrived. Police later discovered Gauze had a long list of prior offenses. He was also wanted for raping a woman in Long Island, New York, one month earlier. Gauze dropped out of sight for almost five years. Five years of torment for his victim. I know that he's raping other women, and I know that other lives are being destroyed. I'd like to see him off the streets. I'd like to see him put away forever. Update. After our broadcast, viewers in the small town of Laurenburg, North Carolina, recognized David Gauze and called our phone center. Gauze had been living there four years under the alias of David Johnson. Gauze was married and was working as a handyman. He was arrested within a week of our broadcast and sent back to New York. Part of the healing of a rape victim is the person being apprehended and her getting her chance to gain her power back. I was happy that, for the victim's sake, that after five years, she now gets a chance for justice in the court system. David Gauze was convicted of seven charges, including rape and sodomy. He was sentenced to 40 years behind bars. Matt and Denise Flores had it all. A loving marriage, a beautiful little daughter, dreams of a full, happy life. Dreams that would vanish in an instant when Matt was gunned down in cold blood. He was just 26. Fort Stewart, Georgia. When Matt married Denise LePage, their friends called it the wedding of the century. Matt was a second lieutenant in the Army who later served with honor in Operation Desert Storm. Once Matt came home to Fort Stewart in Georgia, he and Denise started a family. A few months after his daughter Danielle was born, Matt began a promising career with a computer company based in California's Silicon Valley. He traveled there for a brief training program. It was our, our new start in life as a family, us making decisions instead of the military. This was his dream come true. He he'd finished with the military, he'd done everything right, and now he had landed the, part, the job of his dreams. It was Matt's ninth day of training for his new job. That morning, he arrived at work and parked in a space in the middle of the lot. Nearby, another employee sat listening to a talk show on her car radio. Chris, Chris, we're taking a poll this morning. When a gunshot rang out, she moved to investigate. The female witness realized that he'd been shot and then ran to another person for help and then also ran to a shuttle bus to try and get somebody to call 911 and ask for more help. Approximately four or five uniformed officers responded immediately, including a field supervisor. Paramedics and fire also responded immediately, but they were not able to revive him and he was pronounced dead at the scene. Matt had been shot once in the back of the head at point-blank range. He probably never even saw his killer, and incredibly, no one else did either, even though there were more than 20 people in the parking lot at the time. They said that he was assassinated, basically. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. I kept thinking, this, this is not happening. This is not happening. He was never involved in anything in terms of drugs, gambling, uh, fooling around, any of the things that you would think would lead to being murdered, nothing. We couldn't find anybody that didn't like Matt. Everybody we met, he was somebody you'd be proud to have as a son or a brother. This does not make sense. There were several security cameras covering the parking lot, but the killing took place just out of their view in a blind spot. One of the cameras did, however, give the police their best lead. What you're about to see is a precise recreation of what the tape reveals. About 20 minutes before the shooting, there was a two-door sport model Ford Explorer 
that came into the parking lot and parked in one of the parking stalls facing directly into the camera lens. A few seconds later, a two-door white Ford Probe came in the same lane that Matt would take later. The Explorer backed up, followed the white Probe. The Ford Probe could look something like Matt's rental, which was a white Chevy Corsica. About four minutes before the shooting, we see that same Explorer exiting the parking lot. And then about three minutes before the shooting, we see the vehicle come back into the parking lot and go in the direction of where the shooting occurred. At 8.12 a.m., two minutes before the shooting, two cars enter the lot. One is driven by the female eyewitness, the other by Matt Flores. At 8.14, the murder takes place just out of camera range. 20 seconds later, the Ford Explorer is seen leaving the parking lot for the last time. If somebody were to watch the videotape and see the activities of the vehicle that morning, and to see it leave right after Matt was shot, they certainly could say that the vehicle was stalking Matt that morning. The Explorer initially followed a car that looked just like Matt's. Sergeant Teal believes that the murder may have been a case of mistaken identity. Perhaps somebody went to that parking lot that morning to do harm to somebody else, and they got the wrong person. Look at the flowers. Kiss her door. Whoever did this to him, I want them to know what they've taken. Hi, Grandpa. One minute, your life was great. We had everything. And the next minute, it was shattered. I don't think she remembers them anymore. She was too little. I plan on showing her all the videos that we have so she knows what kind of a daddy that she had. But at the same time, she won't know what it feels like for daddy to hug her. Hi. Are you awake? I lost everything that day. This case is still open, and authorities hope that someone will come forward with a new lead. So far, the best clue is still the Ford Explorer videotaped in the parking lot. The vehicle is a two-door sport model manufactured between 1991 and 1994. It has a distinctive black trim on its lower panels. If you have any information about the death of Matt Flores, please log on to our website at unsolved.com. Next, a mysterious cancer outbreak targets children in a small Nevada town. Fallon, Nevada. Population, 8,000. For many who live here, it seemed like the perfect place to raise a family. But there was something terrible happening to some of the children in this small town. You go, burger. It all began with Dustin Gross. Honey, where'd you get this bruise? I fall off of my back. When I was giving him a bath, I noticed bruises on his back and his arms, and I asked him, what was he doing? Um, why did he have these bruises? And he told me he was playing uh, with his friend on the big wheels. And I thought, okay, that makes sense. That's where the bruises come from. Honey, what are you doing home? Uh, well, he's been tired all day. But then the next day, my husband had noticed a lot more bruises and brought it up to my attention. I see this. I saw he had bruises all over his body, his arms, his legs, his stomach, his back, and little red blood specks on the surface of his skin. And I knew that um, something was wrong at that point. You're gonna feel all better. Brenda took Dustin to the local hospital, and he was immediately transferred to UC Davis Medical Center. The doctor told us that Dustin had leukemia. I knew what leukemia was, I knew it was a cancer, but I didn't actually realize how severe. The type of childhood leukemia Dustin had can be fatal. He was given aggressive chemotherapy. You wanna take your pills? Seeing him lie there, so lethargic and so lifeless, I think that that's probably the hardest thing that I've ever had to deal with. It was not easy. 
Within weeks of Dustin Gross's diagnosis, two more local children were also found to have leukemia. Even at that point, I was just thinking, it's just coincidence. It's just a terrible coincidence, but it's a coincidence. But then shortly after the third, then we got a referral for a fourth. Barbara De Braga feared she was looking at an epidemic. It appeared to be what experts call a cancer cluster. She requested a state investigation. As the state launched an inquiry, the disease struck victims number five and six. A couple of days after there was a seventh case diagnosed, this started to, to kind of make the hair on the back of my neck stand up a little bit. It was, it was a frightening time. We have a series of questions we want to go over with you. Dr. Todd began looking for a common denominator shared by all the victims. How is the water supplied to that house? Is it? It's a well. It's a well. well. Okay. But interviews with the parents produced no answers, and new cases continued to appear. Zach Beardsley was the ninth child diagnosed with leukemia. When I heard I was number nine in a cancer cluster, at that time, my child was so ill that all I could think about was how do I get out of this mess with a healthy child? Tammy Beardsley opened her house to scientific investigators. There was a team of people that came into our home and vacuumed, took dust samples, air quality samples, water samples, biological testing, blood tests. They found no answers inside the homes and turned next to the environment, starting with the water supply. The one thing that makes this community sort of stand out is that they have one of the highest rates of naturally occurring arsenic in their water supply of any place in the nation. Researchers also found mercury in a nearby lake and several canals, places where children were known to play. There were other possibilities. Pesticides had contaminated nearby farms. Underground atomic testing during the 60s had left traces of radiation. But scientists failed to leak any of these factors to the cancer cluster. Working on this really is like trying to do a gigantic jigsaw puzzle. What we can say is that, in fact, we likely will not have the complete puzzle put together at the end of this investigation. There was one other possibility. Fallon is located 10 miles from a naval air station used to train fighter pilots. The jet fuel contains benzene, which is known to cause cancer. There is a pipeline which transports jet fuel. The pipe comes right through and underneath Fallon and, and winds up at the Fallon Naval Air Station. We wondered, was there fuel getting into the water supply? But we didn't find any evidence that the water had been contaminated with jet fuel. There's a, a, a fear inside of me, and I'd like to find out what's making children become diagnosed with leukemia here before I bring another child into the world. Surprise! After two years of intensive chemotherapy, Dustin Gross had his end of treatment party. His cancer was finally in remission. I am worried for my family and my other children, and for Dustin still. I will never give up on pushing the research to find what has caused childhood leukemia and a cluster in this community. Obviously, the more research and continued research is going to get us closer and closer, and I feel that we will find it, um, but we cannot let up. All told, 16 children developed leukemia in a span of five years. Then, for the next five years, not a single new case was reported. But a cluster of 10 childhood leukemia cases was reported in Sierra Vista, Arizona. Experts believe that ground deposits of cobalt and tungsten may have caused the outbreak in Fallon. They've asked for our help in locating other towns with these same conditions. If you know of one, please log on to our website at unsolved.com. Next, a cunning Casanova 
uses different aliases to con lonely women out of their life savings. Police have nicknamed him the Sweetheart Swindler. Why? Well, because he victimizes middle-aged divorcees and widows. One victim, a woman from Missouri we'll call Sarah, has agreed to describe her short five-day encounter with the Sweetheart Swindler. It all began with a phone call. Hello? Oh, hi. Uh, this is Jerry Gamble calling. You remember me? Uh, no. Uh, we, we met last year in a restaurant. You were two friends. This gentleman called me and he said that he had met me and that he was calling to see if I would go out and have dinner with him. How would that be? I was divorced at this time and I wasn't in the habit of dating. So it sounded kind of pleasant and this is one reason why I agreed to go have brunch the next morning. I've been divorced for a long time and I've raised my children myself so I work very Sarah hard. didn't remember where she had met Jerry before. She simply enjoyed the conversation and soon he had completely won her over. I didn't think you were interested at all. I'm, I'm glad we were finally able to get together. Well, I didn't know anything about you or who you were. I enjoyed the brunch, and we decided to kind of spend the day together. Jerry told Sarah that he was in the jewelry business and did a lot of traveling. He said that he was a widower and very lonely. He needed someone to share his life with, traveling from one luxury hotel to another and dining at the best restaurants. He confessed to Sarah that she was just the type of woman that he was looking for. I wanted to believe him and all these bright, beautiful pictures that he painted. Life really hasn't been easy for me. Uh, you know, it was really nice to think that I maybe would be able to relax, to travel, to have all these nice things and I wouldn't have to work. To me, this was very appealing. I made for myself before I die is to visit all 50 states. Jerry took Sarah and her daughter Ellen out to dinner. Ellen was skeptical, but Jerry soon won her over too. Look at those rings and those stones. Aren't those gorgeous? Ellen, here, just try on that little cocktail ring. That's not so little, I'd say. Well, compared to some of the other stones I have, it is. May I try one? Well, right? sure. Go ahead. That's what jewelry's for, is to be worn. Look at that. That's a real diamond. Don't break it. You can't, you can't hurt it. It's indestructible. It's a diamond. Jerry made no sexual advances. But the day after he and Sarah met, he was already making their marriage plans. He asked her to go with him on a road trip, which would be followed up by their wedding. I need to ask a favor of you. I've got some checks coming from the East Coast. Jerry told Sarah that he would soon be receiving several checks and that one would be made out to her so that she could pay her bills before they left. Sarah had no way of knowing that Jerry had stolen the checks from one of his former girlfriends and then made it out to Sarah himself. Late the next afternoon, Jerry rushed Sarah to the bank, telling her the check had just arrived. At the last minute, he asked her to take out some cash for him. Yes, I'd like to deposit this, and I'd like to withdraw $3,000. Ma'am, this is an out-of-state check. Yes. I'm going to have to get my supervisor's approval. Coming in at that time, East Coast banks are closed. I uh, looked at the check, saw that it was made to Sarah. Uh, she was a good customer, and she was insistent. The check was good, so I went ahead and okayed the check for her. You have a good day. Thank you. We were going to Nashville and he was going to get my engagement ring there, and then we were going to go on further east. And when we met up with his daughter and son, then we were going to get married. That same afternoon, just four days after they had met, Jerry and Sarah were on the road to Tennessee in Sarah's car. Jerry had invited Sarah's daughter, Ellen, to go with them. Mama, we're five minutes early. Right. Don't worry about it. In Memphis, Jerry said that he had a business meeting and asked Sarah and Ellen to meet him in the hotel lobby afterwards. He never showed up. 
right over there. We waited around the hotel, and after a couple of hours, I realized that we had been taken. I was angry. Truly, I was angry. I really didn't know what to do. Back in Missouri, Sarah found out that the check Jerry had given her was no good. She had been conned out of $3,000. After she went to the local police to file a report, they discovered that Jerry had been using the same scam all over the country. Since I started my case, I believe he's a suspect in at least 22 other cases in as many as 15 different states. Unfortunately, probably only a third of the cases get reported due to the, to the victims being embarrassed. We think he locates victims primarily through newspaper articles or advertisements. We've known that on occasion he has access to Lonely Hearts Clubs or mailers. You have to understand that that is all he does. And he's very, very good at it. That's how he makes his living. And one shouldn't particularly be embarrassed by being pulled in by this type of scam. And, and I meet a lot of women in my line of work, but I never know whether they're interested in me or they're just after my jewelry. Well, I'm an attorney, and I'd like to see him stopped. I'd like to see him pay for it. I mean, I know how I feel from all this. It's a very devastating feeling. Update. The sweetheart swindler has been captured. Police in Kenosha, Wisconsin, arrested a man calling himself Robert Cook after he romanced a woman and then conned her out of $10,000. At the time of Cook's arrest, police recovered a dozen fake IDs, all issued in different names from different states. The sweetheart swindler was positively identified as Alfred Barraquette, a Canadian national. He was convicted of bank fraud, bank larceny, and interstate transportation of stolen securities. He served his time and has been released. <laughs>